Okay, it's Monday. It's the 12 o'clock rock. I'm Jay Fidel, and this is Think Tech. Welcome to Midnight in Brussels. Uh, our show today is called Europe Reacts to the Trump Russian Controversy. We're going to talk about Europe evolving on policy involving Russia, NATO, nationalism, and nuclear deterrence. Our guest for the show, of course, our major contributor from Europe is Gary Kondakar. Uh, welcome to the show, Gary, again. We'd love to have you here. Thank you. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be on again and again. So, you know, the big story in the U.S., and, I, and people are, you know, sort of, they're sort of attracted involuntarily to reading the news in the middle of the night and finding out what our new president is doing because we can never anticipate. We only know that he manipulates the media. <clears throat> we only know that he makes all these mistakes, and we're not sure if they're intentional or unintentional. And he's got people around him that scare us. <clears throat> so, you know, it's like, it's like a, a reality show, actually, but it has real-world effect, and I believe it has effect in Europe. Do you agree? Yes. Um, it's created quite a stir. Um, one of the biggest cornerstones of Western civilization has been the transatlantic partnership uh, for decades and decades. And today, um, the U.S. is emerging as a threat to Europe, as seen from Europe. So, um, President Trump has vocally supported um, disintegration of Europe, has supported um, various Brexit movements. Um, and this actually goes against U.S. Po policy since the end of the Second World War, that is a united Europe, uh, which is the safest bet, you know. Uh, and it's also um, now emerged as, uh, it's perceived as a big security threat. But every day, I mean, every day is a scandal almost in the U.S., and European leaders don't know really how to react. Um, there's a lot of turbulence globally, and the U.S. has been seen as the harbinger of uh, global security. It's a security provider for the world, or as it's seen from Europe. Yeah. Um, yeah. But with the role, uh, receding role of the U.S., um, most Europeans are worried about what is going to happen to global politics, what is going to happen to stability. Uh, and they're now thinking about assuming a greater role, uh, being more integrated, and how to go uh, uh, forward. Yeah. Well, what, you know, what kind of reaction, you know, not only in terms of the you know, astonishment, but in terms of the governmental reaction and the change in the balance between left and right uh, in yeah. Europe? What, what effect does the travel ban have? And again, there's another travel ban where he, uh, you know, he banned uh, visitors from six countries, not yes. seven. He let Iraq off the hook for reasons that I'm not entirely clear on. Uh, and he gave it until March 16th, so, to, so people would have a chance to pre prepare and plan. But I mean, we have repeated travel bans, and it's very clear that he's willful about this. What kind of effect does this have in Europe? Yes, well, um, it's it, on the first uh, side of it in terms of counterterrorism. So when you want to tackle radical uh, uh, terrorism, any religious radical ter terrorism, um, the biggest mistake that Trump has made is to um, link it to Islam. Uh, and um, American security analysts have, uh, and, and from the, the institutions themselves, they've criticized this move saying that it poses a bigger threat than not linking it. Um, Europe agreed with the U.S. position that, you know, you don't link uh, the jihadist terrorism to Islam because it mainstreams it. It um, creates a more uh, turbulent movement within the religion, perhaps, um, and, and leads to more radicalization uh, when an entire religion is being seen as criminalized. So um, Europe has been against, uh, anyways, the, the linking of Islam and terrorism. But the ban uh, of these six countries, which have not uh, contributed even one terrorist incident in the US, um, is seen as odd. Uh, and many here question, why not a ban on Saudi Arabia or Pakistan? Uh, which right. have caused the majority of foreign uh, terrorist 
attacks in the U.S. Um, sorry, led by foreigners. Yeah. Um, there have been some nationals that have been affected by the travel ban, some European nationals who hold dual citizenship. Uh, and this is being considered as a very serious issue. So as you know, for many, many uh, years, there has been visa-free travel between the U.S. and Europe. Um, to, it's um, Last week, I believe, the European Parliament has uh, moved a proposal uh, to um, suspend this travel ban, if not withdraw it completely. Mm. So there mm -hmm. might not be visa-free travel between the U.S. Uh, and Europe, which is incredible. Yeah, well, it's interesting that Europe is, um, you know, more liberal about it than we are, even though Europe has suffered more greatly than we have. Uh, I think he's taking a page out of the, human, uh, the uh, European experience and, um, and making it sound like it has happened in the U.S., and he's, he's less liberal than Europe is. We, we interviewed a Swedish girl the other day uh, from Sweden, yeah. and she was, she was very upset that Sweden was not accepting migrants. She thought that Germany was the, doing the right thing by accepting lots of migrants. Um, and she was like, uh, not happy with Sweden, her own country. Because, so what, what you have is a sort of a, you know, a moral shift, a shift to morality in Europe, uh, even despite the fact that there have been terrorist attacks. Um, and in the U.S., we have a shift, a, a shift away from that because of Trump, I think. He's elicited that and fomented that, and now we're folding in on ourselves. This is not leadership. No, I agree with you. Um, there are many, many people in Europe. You know, the media also plays a role here in portraying migrants as, um, uh, as how they are portrayed, basically, um, the people they interview. And there's been a lot of negativity surrounding this refugee humanitarian crisis. There are a lot of people here which I interact with myself who are so open to receiving migrants. They've even opened up their own homes to them. And I personally know them. On the other hand, I do see a few who've uh, bought into this skeptical attitude of um, migrants are terrorists, they're bad, um, they, they rape the women. Um, the incidents that have happened, and there have been a few, quite a few, where um, migrants who've come uh, recently into Europe have been um, perpetrating um, violent attacks against women in particular, uh, and that doesn't help their cause either. So it's, you know, it's... We're in a funny place right now. Yes, you know, exactly. It's a, it's a balance Nobody and maybe a tipping point. The situation. Yeah. Nobody seeming to be helping the situation. But this is what I've maintained from a long time is that, um, well, the U.S. had a very strategic attitude towards um, getting uh, migrants from where the migrants come, the kind of migrants they want. Europe has largely received refugees from some of the most rural areas. So I'm talking about North Africa, so Morocco, Egypt, rural, rural areas really. Uh, and when this happens, it's a major cultural clash. Unless you've been growing up here for many generations, it is still a cultural clash. Yes. Uh, and Europe has been at the most liberal end, while these communities have been at the most conservative end. And you can't expect an overnight integration. Yes. So integration does take time. Yes. Um, you know, I wanted to uh, move on to the very interesting talk that's happening in Europe about uh, forming, and it's again a reaction to Trump, uh, forming a joint European nuclear uh, organization uh, if Trump goes through with his threat to withdraw American protection. Um, this, is, this is interesting and a little scary that uh, Europe, for the lack of protection by the U.S., would organize its own nuclear organization and I guess uh, stockpile weapons to that effect. Uh, what have you heard about that? What does it mean? Yes, there have been analysts here calling, so research community calling for it for a long time, uh, to build a European army, to have a common uh, nuclear um, secure Europe uh, based on French nuclear arsenal, which would then be shared and uh, sponsored by a joint fund. But um, these have been proposals and they're unlikely to go ahead. 
uh, for many reasons. Some of the countries are um, um, neutral. Excuse me. Can sorry. Yes, we can uh, hear you. Sorry. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, well, let's take a break. We're about that time in the program where we take a one-minute break. That's uh, Gauri Kandakar. She's talking to us late at night uh, from Brussels to report on things, things in Europe. And there's lots of things in Europe which, interestingly, track uh, what Donald Trump is doing in Washington. We'll be right back. Thank you for watching Think Tech. I'm Grace Chang, the new host for Global Connections. You can find me here live every Thursday at 1 p.m., where we'll be talking to people around the islands or visiting the islands who are connected in various aspects of global affairs. So please tune in and aloha and thanks for watching. Okay, I'm here with Brent Obergaard of the Faculty of the School of Journalism in the Department of Communications at UH Manoa. We've had a number of shows. We have a movable feast going on, and we talk about journalism, we talk about language, we talk about communication in general, and we talk about the effect of that on the country and on individual people. Brent, it's so good to, to be able to discuss this with you in our movable feast. Oh, it's my pleasure. This is a great opportunity. You'll have to come back again and again, okay, deal? Uh, that's the deal. Brent Obergaard, I'm Jay Fidel. We care about everything. Thanks. Hey, we're back. We're live. We're here with Gauri Kandakar. She joins us by Skype from Brussels, and we learn about what's happening in Europe. And now we're examining what, what is happening in Europe in response to things that Donald Trump is doing in Washington. And one of the things that's happening is there has been talk by some leaders about forming a joint European nuclear deterrent organization. Um, on, on the assumption that Trump will withdraw American protection from Europe and NATO. Uh, so uh, wh where does that all go? You indicated before we, before we left for the break that you didn't think it was going to happen. No, there won't be any European army for, for, for the foreseeable future. Um, most European leaders, uh, especially Germany, uh, remain against it. Um, Germany, of course, for historical reasons, does not want an armed uh, European army, let's say, and it does not want to lead it. Uh, now, they're very cost. sensitive about that, aren't they? There were remarks yeah. made by Recep uh, uh, Erdogan in Turkey uh, yeah. over the weekend, uh, para making, making a comparison of the Germans to the Nazis back when, and wow, the Germans reacted very badly to that. They do not like to go back to that time. They don't want to be, they don't want to be uh, criticized for being like Nazis. None of them want, actually the Germans have, um, well, to be, <laughs> to, let's um, give the facts, there are many countries in Europe who've, uh, who've, um, who, who bring up the German past, let's say, especially the Greeks with the Greek crisis when it was at its peak. Uh, and some of the Greeks still do because they're unhappy with Germany and, you know, they want to draw parallels to Earth Germany. Um, and Erdogan is no different, I guess. Um, politically uh, and technically, it would not be very feasible because, well, European budgets are on, uh, uh, on the decline. Uh, anyways, austerity has become the norm almost in Europe, even though Europe has, has been growing recently. Um, none of these countries have really emerged from the crisis still uh, and contributing, making major contributions to defense will not um, be on the cards. This, is one, this has been one of the main issues that Trump has been uh, pushing forward with Europe is for them to spend more uh, money into the NATO military budget and that is unlikely to happen in the foreseeable future. Mm, interesting. So that leaves it in Trump's court. Well, yes, uh, speaking um, of courts, uh, there's, there's been a report that the International Court of Justice in The Hague is hearing yes. a case brought by co the country of Ukraine against Russia. I find it very interesting. And in that case, Ukraine is claiming that, uh, accusing Moscow of illegally annexing cr Crimea and illicitly funding separatist rebel rebels in, uh, in the Ukraine. Uh, and a very interesting, maybe a precedent setting uh, legal experience in the court. Uh, what have you heard about that one? Well, this is really recent um, news and uh, what I can say is that of course um, this was illegal. Most of the countries in the world have agreed that it's illegal ex except for some of the BRICS countries actually who've supported Russia. Um, 
Now, it's an unprecedented case, as you say. Uh, what will be the um, power of the uh, International Court of Justice to impose this decision on Russia? It's uh, We still have to wait and see. But especially how the case goes down, you can already say that, you know, um, Ukraine will be receiving European support as they did support Philippines when it um, uh, when it went against uh, China yeah. in the court of um, first instance yeah. court I believe in in the Hague um, but I, I, I it's too early days to comment on this okay <laughs> but you know there is a really chilling parallel between what happened in the in the South China Seas uh, and uh, what happened in Ukraine uh, and, and the fact that the International Court of Justice Tribunal uh, got involved uh, in the case of the, the China experience, um, China has, has essentially ignored the ruling. Um, and, I, and I imagine that Russia would likewise ignore a ruling, uh, you know, that their takeover was illegal. But it all, it all, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, they will, of course, as you, you, you're spot on, they are going to ignore the ruling. Nothing's happened to China. China is building territory in those tiny islands in the South China Sea. Um, politically, it might create some impact. Um, Russia has been reeling under the sanctions effect, which might continue, but that has also affected most European countries because Russia is the top supplier of fuels. Uh, but um, I don't think legally it might change anything. Crimea is not going back to Ukraine. Yeah. I don't believe that. Well, more and more, it, it seems that Russia is emerging and Putin is emerging as a rogue, um, not, not caring much about what people and the, uh, you know, the international community think of what he's doing and taking very aggressive steps. Um, and, you know, and then, of course, uh, the, the issue with Trump, which could, which could be Trump's Achilles uh, heel, um, is his relationship with China and the relationship of his staff, uh, campaign staff and current staff uh, with Russia. I'm sorry. And, and the, uh, the, the, the concern there is that he may have an illicit relationship with them, that he's not willing to talk about things that might be wrong or criminal uh, that will embarrass him greatly uh, or worse. Uh, and, <clears throat> and I wonder how people in Europe feel about that, because more and more it appears that he did do things that were wrong, um, and more and more, this, this threatens his presidency. But what do the people in Europe feel about his relationship with Russia? It's unnerving. So many uh, countries in Europe, Finland, Sweden, Norway, even uh, all the Baltic states fear, really fear a Russian invasion. And this is a palpable threat when you go east from Brussels. Even Poland is afraid that um, Russia might invade them. Russia has been the biggest security threat to Eastern Europe, uh, and it still is. Uh, and while the U.S. has been the biggest guarantor of security for East, Central and Eastern Europe until now, it's a complete overnight shift, yeah. which yeah. countries have not been prepared for. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And now um, they've really been left in a quandary. So those countries like Greece, for example, who've had a cordial relationship with Russia might not be that much uh, in, a, in danger, <laughs> let's say, yeah. or in political yeah. turmoil. Yeah. But uh, for countries like Sweden, for instance, or Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, all the Baltic states, all the Central and Eastern countries, it is an existential threat. And that's how their policies are going to be shaped now, especially in Europe, inside the EU. Well, this has got to affect the way they see the United States, who was their protector before and is now leaving them in the lurch. Um, and I, you know, I, I think that probably changes the, the world order, at least as far as Europe is concerned. And diplomatic relations, perceptions on the street and in government and diplomatic community have got to change because of what he's doing. Don't you think? Well, <laughs> it's... Um how do I put it? it? Most of the community is not seeming to take Trump's statement so uh, credibly. You see what I mean? Because it changed from one day to another. If you see the, uh, his statements on the Palestine-Israel uh, issue, uh, uh, before he was elected, he 
he said that he would not support a two-state solution, while very recently he said he would support anything that both parties want, which is basically a two-state solution. So it's hard to take uh, anything credibly. Um, yeah. Also, his uh, statements on uh, NATO and then when the uh, American defense chiefs come to Brussels, they have been assuring the countries of uh, support um, despite uh, they've been assuring of U.S. security guarantee to Europe. So it's um, you won't see a very strong uh, statement from European leaders because they're still trying to make sense of what is happening. Yes, yes, and so are we. <laughs> but you know, one thing is clear that there was manipulation or attempted manipulation of the American election in November by the Russians. And what I found very interesting and a good reminder of the reality of that is uh, a remark made by Boris Johnson in, in, in Britain. And uh, he made a statement. He wanted to make it clear to Russia that they should, quote, keep their nose out, end quote, of European elections. And, and I guess drawing a parallel, if, if the uh, Russians uh, would uh, attempt to um, manipulate an election in the U.S., why not do that in Europe? Has there been any they evidence that they that. have done that or would do that in Europe? They are doing that. They, um, if you notice, um, Russia has been very active, of course, in um, the French elections. So Marine Le Pen, the leader of the far-right party from National, mm -hmm. her party received about 10 million euros from the Russian government <gasps> no. or the Russians. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Kurt Wilders in the Netherlands as well. He's, he's uh, covertly receiving uh, funds from Russia as well. So Russia has been funding um, these far-right movements across. And there are possible news that they've even um, uh, provided funds to um, the Brexit. Um, those who were um, those who would wish to leave 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 the EU. Yes, they, they funded Brexit. Movements, far right movements, because the United Europe is not in Russia's interest. So the Marine Le Pen Front National case is documented. The others, there is speculation, but there are credible links that Russia has been funding these movements across Europe. Oh, that's shocking. I wasn't aware of that, but I think we have to follow that closely. Uh, yes. It is one thing for a non-democratic non state, and I consider Russia a non-democratic state, uh, to try to manipulate political events in, in democratic states. That's very scary. So yes, are you writing anything? In these? Uh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, I mean, just to give another example, I think it was 2008, or I, I, I don't remember the year, but very recently, uh, in the last decade itself, uh, there was a cyber attack by Russia on Estonia. Estonia is one of the most um, uh, IT advanced countries. So basically, to give you an example, people can file their taxes, their annual taxes in 3.5 minutes. Flat. Uh, so it's that advanced, and people work with one card, which they use for transport, medical, everything. And the Russian cyber attack on Estonia was in a similar direction, you know, but it was a large security threat. So Russia has been very much present uh, in European countries, meddling in their affairs, uh, and it's no surprise for us here, probably. Yeah. Well, it's, it's really awful, and I think we need to follow it. We need to follow it with you in two weeks' time. Uh, we learned so much from you, Gowrie. That's Gowrie um, Kondekar, and, and we are at the end of our show now. We have enjoyed bringing it to you and t talking with her, as always. Uh, and um, uh, I look forward to our next contact with you, Gowrie. It's been great. Thank you. Me too. Thank you. Aloha. Take care. Aloha.